Well, I want to take this uh, chance to say grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to get started in just a moment, but if you're here hearing my voice and you're still in the commons, we invite you with passion to come in and join us for worship. God bless you if you're online with us today. We're so happy that you're worshiping with us. We know that sometimes you're online with us because you're not feeling well, and so maybe you're recovering from illness. We pray that the Lord restore you to your health, and if you're online because you're thinking about coming and visiting us, uh, we certainly pray that you will. We invite you to come and uh, be a part. Uh, And so I want to remind the church as we get ready to offer our voices and our worship to the Lord uh, that two Sundays ago, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. But do you remember that Jesus is still resurrected? Amen. And we're going to celebrate that today. One of the things that we work really hard, and we actually talk about this often, is for us to continually and perpetually do what we can to help us remember that it isn't just that Jesus rose from the dead, it's that we have been given life as well. And we remember what it was like before we did. And the scripture, you may hear the scripture this morning and say, I think I remember that. You should because we look at this scripture all the time. This is uh, the scripture that we'll begin with this morning. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. And it just talks about who we were before Jesus rescued us. So if you're here or if you're online with us, I just want you to hear this scripture, receive the scripture this morning as we get ready to begin. God's word says, and you, me, all of us, we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, We all once lived in these passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And then there's this little phrase, but God, but God. We're celebrating this morning because of this little phrase, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and you've been, and he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to pray this morning and then we're going to begin worshiping. But I want all of us to sing this morning with this remembrance of who we were before the Lord Jesus rescued us. Father, we thank you for giving us a testimony if we're in Christ. We're thankful that the empty tomb not only reminds us that you are living, but that in Christ we are living. We were dead in our trespasses, but God, you made us alive in Christ. Thank you, O Lord. Hear us as we sing. See through to our hearts. Meet us where we are. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met you You called to your 
Fellowship Church, hope you're awake. We're going to sing together this morning, thanking Jesus, saying hallelujah. Thank you for the cross. Sing, I'd be hopeless without your goodness. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love Slave to the darkness If it wasn't for the cross So you want me You have won me with your kindness you Chase me down when Oh, I was lost. Where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. Oh, because with your blood, you bought my freedom. words this morning. All my shame was met with mercy. All my shame was met with mercy. Amen. And now your mercy will be my song. Oh, the glory. Oh, the glory. Oh, the power of the cross.
Jesus, I was in. Cause with your blood, you, you bought my freedom. Oh, hallelujah for the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not always with your blood. You, you bought my freedom. Oh, hallelujah for the throne. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. Cause with your blood, you, you bought my freedom. Oh, hallelujah for the cross. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Isn't that good? Amen. I'm a little out of breath this morning singing those songs. Uh, maybe you are as well. Uh, let me just take a moment to tell you what we're doing this morning. And in just a moment, uh, we're going to have a responsive reading. We've gotten good at those things, you guys. We're doing good with responsive readings. Uh, and, and I'm excited. Uh, we're in for a treat today because uh, we're introducing a new responsive reader leader. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Samuel, come up and stand with me if you would. Just a moment, Samuel's going to lead us in our responsive reading. I love this guy so much. His love for Jesus is amazing, his boldness for the Lord. And so I'm excited he's leading us this morning in a responsive reading. Uh, before I do that, let me say welcome to our guests. We all have been new at this church at some point, And we remember that it takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage to go to a new place park in a new parking spot, walk through a new door, sit in a new seat. And so we work really hard just to remember that, that it does take a lot of courage. So we, that's not lost on us. If you're a guest today, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I want to tell you something about our church. We're not a perfect, perfect church. <laughs> We're not a perfect church, but we worship a perfect God. Amen. And if this, is, if this is a place where you're seeking to grow in your faith, uh, then I just want to, this is a place, I'm sorry, I'm just so, I'm so excited that Samuel's next to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> I just love this so much. Uh, but if you're looking to grow in your faith, this is a place for you. We, we are not perfect, and that doesn't excuse, we, we try really hard to follow Jesus, and we'll be talking about that today. Today's church uh, sermon is called Church Hurt. It's about when we get hurt in life in, in the body of Christ. But this is a place that you can grow in your faith. And so if you're a guest, then we invite you to come to the Welcome Center uh, at the end of the service. And if you are a first-time guest today, i got to tell you guys, you picked the right Sunday. Today is what's called Newcomer's Reception, which is a whole lunch for people who are new to our church. <laughs> so if you're here as a guest, uh, we would love for you to stay after and hang out with us. Let us share some more uh, information with you about our church. And if you are a guest, you didn't know this, but last week there were so many diapers piled up here. I was on the, on the, uh, on the live stream and I barely see Chris as he was preaching through the diapers. It was so awesome to see. Uh, and so our goal was 800. We needed 800. Uh, we had even 66 come in uh, today. So that brings our total to 10,699. Isn't that awesome? And I know all glory goes to God, and I know that as I encourage you, you would be quick to say it is for the Lord, and it is for the Lord, but I'm so thankful that we are a body of Christ that cares about people, and that is an expression of that. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Sam is waiting for me to get off the platform, so I'm going to go. 
Samuel's going to read the response of reading. Remember, he reads the leader part and you read the congregation part. Go for it, Samuel. All right. The one true living God is good and trustworthy in every way. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 declares this to the people of God saying, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandment to a thousand generations. Scripture teaches us that there are moments in life where we may struggle to understand our Lord, but we can still trust the Lord. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. In trusting you, Jesus, we find life. It is sweet to trust in the name of Jesus, so we shall today, and we, so we shall forevermore. Amen. Thank you. And you may be standing for worship. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. so sweet to trust in Jesus to take him at his word Yeah. 
all sing with me this morning. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. next song that we're about to sing together is one that we normally sing during December, uh, during Christmas time. Uh, but these words ring true still right now. The verses even include the fact that the tomb is empty, doesn't stay at Jesus' infancy, continues on to explain and exclaim everything that he did. And we come to this chorus where it says, oh come, let us adore him. And that is not just for Jesus in his infancy. That's not for us to just sing during December. That's for us to come and adore the Jesus who is risen and who is at his Father's right hand right now. And so we put our deep expression of love and gratitude onto Jesus. That's what it means to adore, to give him worship and praise. And so we'll sing this song together. And behold who our Jesus is, not just an infant who came, but someone who lived a whole life sinlessly, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again and is seated with our Heavenly Father. Let's sing together this morning. Behold, the King has come, divinity incarnate. Behold, the King has come, divinity incarnate, creator of the world, breathing our air. Behold, Savior of the world is finally single come church. Oh come, let us adore him. Come, let us 
us adore Him, for He alone is worthy, Christ the Lord. Behold the Father's love, beyond all comprehension.
voices to you this morning and now Lord we turn to a different posture Lord of listening of receiving of hearing your word and allowing it to take root into our hearts Lord I, I love that worship helps us to draw us closer to you helps us to get in the right frame of mindset Lord maybe we have come in here with complete opposite mindset of wanting to worship Maybe we've been hurt this morning or frustrated or sad. And so, Lord, we take time to just sit in your presence, to praise you for who you are, that no matter what our circumstances say, it doesn't define who you are. You are still good no matter what. And so, Lord, we lift our hearts up to you today. Do exactly what you want to do within them. 
Pray over Pastor Zach this morning as he comes to give the message, Lord. Impart on him exactly what we need to hear, Holy Spirit. Give us the words that we need to hear. And Lord, I pray that it would fall on a soft heart and not ones that are hard. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us first. And it's in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I've been so excited and challenged, honestly, about getting ready for this uh, short three-week uh, sermon series called Church Hurt uh, for a whole host of reasons. Some of them I'll share with you this morning and some uh, as we move on. You know, as a pastor, it kind of struck me a little bit that we even have a word or phrase to share to talk about people who've been hurt or damaged in the church. Like the fact that we even have this phrase, church hurt, says a lot about uh, the life of the body of Christ. And maybe you're here today and you're going, well, I've never heard that phrase. Awesome. That's a good thing. If you've never uh, heard the phrase church hurt before, praise God for that. Uh, but church hurt is a phrase that inside of the body of Christ, you know how we have like this Christianese, sometimes we use language that not rest of the world understands. Uh, if you're from the old school church, if, if somebody says, when did you walk the aisle? Well, that's Christianese for when did you give your life to Christ, right? And the invitation, when did you walk the aisle and come down and talk to the pastor about uh, receiving the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior? So I guess church hurt is kind of Christianese. It is the phrase that we use to describe when somebody in the church has been hurt by somebody in the church. And so I've really struggled with the fact that we even have a phrase for that. And as I've struggled with that and as I've been challenged in putting this message series together, I really paused and thought, well, in a way it makes a lot of sense because our church is a family. And I, I don't think I have to say too much or go too long for you to understand that in family, there can be hurt or conflict or offense. Uh, it, it, in fact, probably you just pause right now to think through your family and, and your immediate family and your extended family. You can probably think of somebody and go, oh, that's the one. That everybody else is kind of like at odds with, right? And so I'm not saying that's good. I'm not saying we want to keep that there. But I'm just saying that as it relates to this series and even as it relates to us just having a phrase that describes when people in church have been hurt by people in church, it is a little bit predictable, isn't it? That when a church our size exists together, does life together, journeys together together, laughs together and cries together and labors together and serves together, at some point, somebody in the family is going to be hurt. And so this series is designed for us to acknowledge that, for us to understand that there's a lot of people in the church today who have been hurt by other people in the church. But but more than that, this this series is designed to to create a vision for how we might respond to church hurt. And today we're looking at the story of Hannah that's in 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you're new to the church, uh, 1 Samuel's in the Old Testament. I invite you to turn there if you don't have a Bible and you need one. We'd love to give you a copy of the Bible after service. I know a lot of people uh, use it digitally, look, use their phone or their tablet. But if you're here and you don't have a copy of the Bible and need one, see us after services. We'd love to give you a copy. Uh, this morning, we're looking at the life of Hannah. Next week, we'll be in the New Testament uh, discovering other places in God's Word and in the history of God's people where where people in the church have been hurt by other people in the church. But today, 
We are looking in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'm going to look at about 20 verses, friends. And so when we jump into this and we start reading this, there's going to come a point where you think in your mind, whoa, he's read a lot of scriptures today. Uh, Oftentimes we look at one or maybe five verses. But I think today we need to look at all of these verses to really understand, number one, what's going on. But secondly, like how does all of this church hurt happen? So this is the story of Hannah. There's going to be a lot of moments as I'm reading this where you're going to go, ooh. And and I invite you to do that because part of us understanding of the life of Hannah is appreciating and understanding her difficult background. Look with me if you would, starting in verse 1. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkina, he was the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf. How would you like that <laughs> to be your lineage? Those are some strange names to this American ear, I've got to tell you. He was an Ephraimite. He had two wives. There's your first, ooh. Right? There's where we know it's already heading in the wrong direction. Right? This man had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And there's where the drama continues to build, isn't it? Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Now, you may be pausing there going, wait, who is the rival? Don't don't think long. It's there. The other wife. Right? You may be going, well, it doesn't say the name. It doesn't have to say the name. Not on this one, right? We know who the rival is. And she's vicious. She is using the fact that Hannah can have no children to provoke her, grievously to irritate her. And so, verse 7, it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Pause. We'll get to the whole scripture in just a minute. But guys, I need you to look at me just for a moment. Husbands, I need you to lock in with me. If you didn't perceive what just happened, you and I need to talk after the service. Okay. Here is this woman who is weeping because she has the heart to be a mother. And she cannot. And her husband is so dialed in that he has the wisdom. I'm saying that sarcastically to say, sweetheart, what's wrong? Am I not like 10 sons to you? Can you understand how everybody's missing the boat with Hannah in their life? Like he's, we'll get to this in a moment. But I just think to myself, how can you be so oblivious? And, and I can promise you this, he doesn't want to hear the answer to that question. Am I not worth more to you than 10 sons? Uh, so after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, I'm in verse 9 if you're following. Hannah got up, she rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting in the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed. Hannah, and she prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and you will remember me and not forget your servant, but you will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all of the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. If that last part threw you off, that was just a commitment in the Old Testament. Sometimes people would make uh, with this specific type of vow to God that they would not cut their hair. And she continued praying before the Lord. And Eli, the priest, who's there in the temple as well, he observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, and her, only her lips were moving, and her voice was not heard. And therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? 
Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord. I'm a woman troubled in my spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel will grant your petition that you've made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And they rose early in the morning, and they worshiped before the Lord. And they went back to their house, and then Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. If you have your notes, you see, we're really just going to walk through this and think to ourselves, where's this church hurt coming from? And what's up with this guy, Eli? Like, what planet is he living on, right? And then we're going to think about Hannah's response, because this series is not only understanding the source of church hurt, but this series is also really about looking at people who process that well and who navigate that well. And, and Hannah did a remarkable job. And then you know that we're always going to kind of turn the scripture towards us and say, how do we apply this? So let's talk first about the source of the church hurt that Hannah experienced. You see a lot of pain. You see a lot of difficulty. But if I had to boil this down, I think it, if I just had one sentence like you have in your notes, I would say that the source of church hurt was being misjudged during her most vulnerable moments of life. And I, I pause to give you a moment to write that, but more than to give you a moment to write that, it's just for you to think about that for a second. Think about these vulnerable moments in her life that she's endured. The scripture says year after year after year. And we noted them as we went along, but let me just read them off for you again. So uh, she's living in a marriage that is not under the authority of God, not God's vision for marriage. Uh, this guy has two wives. And it's very clear from the garden that there's to be a husband and a wife, not a husband and two wives. And here's this man who's living outside of the will of God in his marriage. And, and Hannah is feeling the other side of that. And she's the one that's feeling the pressure and the pain of that. And not only is she living with a husband who's outside of the will of God, but she's not able to have children. And she longs to have children. And the Bible says her rival, that's the, 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 the descriptor that the Bible gives for uh, Elkanah's other wife, could have kids and not only could have kids, but would take that and rub that in Hannah's face over and over and over again. And so she's just broken. She would just go into the church building. It's called a temple in those days. But she would go into the temple and just weep before God. And then she has again. And when I say this husband. I don't mean that in a negative sense. But she has this husband. But she's weeping to have a child. And he's clueless. Am I not as good as ten sons to you? Quit all of this crying. Like he just couldn't dial in and connect. And she's living this life. So what does she do? She does what we would tell everybody to do, right? Go in front of God. Go get with God. Pour all of that stuff out. And just get in the presence of God and yell and weep and pray and just be in the presence of God. Sometimes that's the only thing that helps. And she does that faithfully. And then what happens? This priest, his name's Eli. He's never seen anybody have this type of moment with God. It is so raw and intense. And he misjudges her. In her most vulnerable moments, he misjudges her. And he thinks she's a drunk woman. He says, hey, you drunk? How long are you going to be a drunk? Stop, put all of this beside you, right? Like he is, he is criticized. She is at the altar of God. 
And this priest walks over and totally misjudges the whole situation. So there's where the church herd comes from. Like she's trying to live out her faith. She's trying to be obedient and be in the presence of God. And there's this figure in the temple that completely misjudges her. Now, the reason that I think this is significant is because I don't think this just happened 5,000 years ago or whatever it was. I think you and I, many people in this room, maybe online, carry this experience with us. I think many of us have the experience of seeking God and somebody, maybe it was a friend or maybe not, maybe it was like a priest or a pastor who completely misjudged us. And so I want to take a second and I want for us not just to understand the source of the church hurt, but I want for us to see Eli's mistakes. Now, you could say mistake, like singular, right? But if you were just to take that interaction and say, how do we break this down to really understand what happened? Like, what's going through Eli's mind? Like, how does this ha- How does a person who's carrying baggage and comes to the church and comes down here and starts praying, how does a pastor miss it so bad that he accuses this person of something that isn't even remotely close. I want to share with you how. If you're making notes this morning, this is the second section, which is Eli's mistakes. The first mistake that Eli makes is that he is missing a lot of context. Eli had no idea the challenges and the pain and the difficulty that Hannah brought with her into the prayer room that day. And the reason that I think that this is significant is whether you're a guest here for the first time or or you're a person who's been here since the church began, the reality is this. Every single week, you and I, we come into the house of God carrying things that nobody really knows about. And it is so often that people don't really understand our full context when people engage us and and seek to relate to us and talk with us. And, And so it is just so common for us to have interaction as a church family, but but to not even really be cognizant of the fact that when I talk with you or maybe when you talk with me, we don't really know the burdens that we just brought each of us into this building. And when we don't know the context of where somebody is at, it's really, really easy to misunderstand them. And so one of the mistakes that Eli makes is he failed to understand the true context of the situation in life that Hannah was actually in. Now, the second mistake that Eli makes is that he has the wrong goal. Eli wants to confront and correct instead of comfort the one who has sought refuge in the temple of God. And I've seen this happen in in everyday life. I've seen this happen in my home. I've seen my kids come to their dad and share something, hoping that I'll be the loving dad and just kind of grab them in arms. But instead, Zach gives the dad lecture. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? You know the dad lecture? Well, when I was growing up, right, right, right. And they're coming to me going, man, I just need my dad to squeeze me and tell me I love you and it's going to be okay. And instead, you know, they get this 45 minute lecture. Sometimes this happens to us at church. Sometimes we're here, we're burdened, we walk in with tears in our eyes, we, you know, suck it all back in and walk in and put a smile on our face. And somebody says, ah, how you doing? And you have the courage to say, man, I'm struggling. Really? Yeah, this happened or that happened or I really messed up last week. And you just need comfort and support. And instead, what you get is correction. Now, pause. Every follower of Jesus is getting nervous. Just pause. Hear me. We all need correction. All right? I'm not going that direction. So let me reel you back in if you think that I'm about to tell you that there's never a place for correction and never a place for discerning judgment. There is. But, but do you understand what's happening to this lady? She needs comfort. 
She is broken in every which way. And instead, the priest thinks that the right thing to do is to confront her and to try to correct. The third is mistake that he makes is that he speaks to her with reckless words. Now, I'm going to admit something <clears throat> because I think it's important for us to see this nuance. And, and I just want to really be clear that there's a limitation that you and I have when we, all these years later, look at this text. We don't know the tone of Eli, nor are we given his motivation or his intentions. All we know is what he said. We don't know the tone. But I will be honest with you, when Pastor Zach reads this, I read it with a little condescending tone. Now, he may not have been condescending. Uh, he may have got real close to her and said, Hannah, what are you doing, girl? You have got to stop this, right? Like maybe it was with the compassion and tone. I don't know, but whether it was the tone that I read it with or I'm reading it with the wrong tone and it was a compassionate tone, it was still reckless words. Here's why. Let's say, let's say that what Eli thought was true. Let's say that Hannah was struggling processing all of these difficulties in her life. She's thinking about, my husband's got another wife. She's got all these kids. She's so mean to me. She's always trying to make me cry. My husband doesn't even understand why this is important to me. Of course it's not important to him. He's got all these kids with this other woman. I can't have kids. She's just going on and on. And, and let's, just, let's just say Eli's right. Let's just say that Hannah broke. And so the morning before she went to the temple, she went on an all-night bender and drank as much, whatever they had in those days. I don't know what they drank, but let's just say she drank all she could get her hands on. And the next morning, she stumbled into the temple and poured her heart out before God. <laughs> Where else should she be? Where else should she be besides the altar of God? Like, so what if Eli would have been right? This would have been the place for her. And so he thinks that his role is just to speak all of this rebuke and correction onto her. And even if he would have been right about the judgment, it still was reckless. This is the greatest place for somebody who's struggling with that. The altar of God. Pouring out your heart before God. And so Eli has, makes all of these mistakes, all of this church hurt. And so we know the source. We see the mistakes that Eli made. And I got to tell you as a pastor, can I just tell you how scary this passage is to me? I sit in my office and half laugh out loud going, how can there be somebody as clueless as Eli? And then think to myself, oh, Lord in heaven, please. Don't ever let me mess up this bad. I can't imagine how I would feel if I misjudged somebody like that. And so you noticed when she corrected him and he said, oh, may the Lord bless you and give you everything that you want. Out of total embarrassment is the way that I read that, right? But his mistakes are significant. And I, and I articulate them not to be mean to Eli, but I articulate them because these very things are prevalent in our life today. We struggle. We struggle with understanding context. Sometimes we think that a person needs a rebuke when they need comfort. And to be honest, sometimes we think somebody needs comfort and they need correction. Sometimes we speak with reckless words. Do you know that you can be right and use reckless words and do more damage than when you started the conversation? Did you know you can have the right perspective and use reckless words and do so much damage? So church hurt isn't just something that Hannah experienced. I think it's something that many of us have experienced. And what I want for us to do is not only look at Eli and go, oh, 
What are you thinking, man? But I want for us to look at Hannah's response. Because if you're making notes this morning, I gave you two words to really capture Hannah's responses. And that is, the first word is gracious. But the second word is correction. And here's what I want you to see about Hannah. What she didn't do was get angry, jump up, storm out the door out the temple and yell as she's slamming the door. I'm never coming back. She didn't do that. She didn't go home, call all of her friends. Do you know what just happened to me at the temple? You should never go back to that temple. Let me just tell you right now. They're horrible down there. She didn't go online, leave a one-star review for the Jerusalem temple, right? Like, I'm laughing about this, but you guys, this type of stuff happens <laughs> in real life. i got to tell you this. These types of things happen. Look at what she did. Now, because what she also didn't do is just quietly accept the abuse. She stood up for herself. She addressed the situation. She handled this so well, you guys. May I pray that if I ever find myself in this situation, that I will be as courageous as Hannah. I want you to look at her in verse 15. Look at her response with me this morning. Hear what she said. Verse 15. Know my Lord. Huh. Just right from the jump. Nope. Nope. No, my Lord. She's respectful. No, my Lord. I'm a woman troubled in my spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. Do you see that she's making commands of the priest now? Look at how strong she's responding to this. It is gracious, but it is to the point. Do not regard your servant as a worthless. I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and my vexation. She stood up for herself in such a powerful, meaningful, gracious way. She disagreed immediately verbally. She said, no, 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 no. This is not what's going on. And she explained what was going on. She filled in the missing pieces. She said, look, you're seeing it this way, but I'm telling you, this is what it is. And then Eli responds, oh my goodness, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. So I think it's important for us not just to see all of these mistakes of Eli, but to really behold Hannah's response Because it isn't a response that is unhealthy in storming out and trying to cause chaos and doing. It's not that, but nor is it ignoring the issue, which sometimes, quite frankly, is what happens when we're inside of the family of God and somebody's offended or somebody's hurt. And and you're like, well, I don't know what to do. Well, let's just don't say anything, right? Just be quiet. Don't upset everything and we sweep it under the rug and we act like it never happened. And now there's this thing inside of the church face. She doesn't do either one of those. She confronts it so well. And I commend her response to you as an option if you ever experience church hurt. And so then with the time we have left, the question is, how do we apply this to our life? You see in your notes, I want to share with you three When I say practical, I don't mean non-important. These are important but practical ways that we can take the weight of what we've just looked at and go, how do I live that out? Because I think we can all feel the weight of it. We all understand church hurt exists. We all can look at Hannah and go, oh, bless her heart. She's just got difficulty after difficulty. and, And then we hear Eli and we just... It's like looking at a car wreck, right? Like you don't want to do it, but you're like, oh, this is horrible. And then her response. So what do we learn from that? Well, the first thing that I want to do to apply it to our life is giving you a negative. Like don't do this, okay? I I want to encourage you. Don't let people keep you from God. 
This is one of the most incredible things about Hannah is that in that temple, she was not going to let Eli, even though he was a priest, even though he was like the boss of the temple or whatever, right? He, he was a person of influence, a person of power, but she was not going to let his misjudgment keep her from God. And the reason I think that's important is because I know a lot of people that I love dearly who have a hard time walking with God because somebody offended them at some point in their life. And there's just that, that, that double tragedy that a person would have the power to keep them. Eli, Hannah wouldn't give Eli that power. You may be important in the temple. You may be the priest. I respect you. She said, no, my Lord. You know, she was very gracious. But she said, one thing's going to be true today. You will not keep me from being with my God. I remember when I turned 21, at the time I was not married to Crystal, we were dating. And uh, I was in the in talks with her parents uh, to ask her to marry me. And, and uh, so it was the season before we were engaged, before we got married. And I turned 21. And I'll never forget, Alan and Debbie said, Zach, you know, we want to celebrate you and take you out for your 21st birthday. So we want you to meet us at this restaurant. And I was like, whoa, that's a fancy restaurant. I'd never been. I'd heard people talk about this restaurant, but I'm 21. I don't have two dimes to rub together, right? Like I'm, I've never been there before. So I was like, oh, cool. So we're going to go there. So you know, I show up and I get out of my car and right there from the restaurant, somebody tries to steal my car from me. I'd never had this happen before, right? Like I get out and this person just gets in my car and I look at them like they're crazy and said, oh, well, we park it for you and bring it back. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know about that. <laughs> they were trying to steal everybody's car that day, right? I'm like 21 years old, never had that happen before. So now I'm feeling fancy, right? So you know, I'm walking down the sidewalk, looking through the restaurant. The restaurant is like one of those restaurants where all the outside panels are glass. So you can look right into the restaurant. They had this incredible, like, open kitchen concept. And, like, the chefs are back there and all white. And they're, like, doing all kinds of cool stuff. And, and I can see uh, Alan and Debbie. I see them through the window. And they're like, and I'm like, so I walk in the door. And I don't know what they're called. But anyway, they're the ones that are standing there to greet people. And so fancy, like all done up. And this guy looks at me and says, I see we're coming straight from the gym today. I was like, you know, I've never been the smartest person in the room, but I knew that was an insult. And I remember thinking to myself, man, Zach, what are you going to do? I, I, like part of me was sad Part of me, like I could just feel my temperature rising and I could start envisioning like, you know, you don't talk to me like that. I'm, you know, but anyway, I'm like just beside, can you imagine somebody saying that to you? You're coming straight from the gym today. But then what happened was that I looked past this guy and I saw Alan and Debbie sitting at the table going like this. And all of a sudden, I just quit paying attention to this guy. And I just smiled. This is a phrase we use in Texas, as big as Texas. I just smiled as big as Texas. And I said, that's my party. I'm going to go right over there. And I walked right past him. I never saw him again in my life. But I was so offended. But when my eyes caught what would become my in-laws, smiling and saying, come on. I was able to just move on, move past it. Was it right? Absolutely not. That guy should have been fired for talking to me like that. But I refuse to allow him to stop me from going to sitting with my in-laws and having a magnificent meal. Can I just say that to you about church hurt and people it may be, and, and, and in fact, I would be so bold as to say that if, if you stick around the fellowship long enough, eventually somebody will say something to you and you'll go, well, what, what, what do they mean by that? What do they mean by that? Are they being rude to me? And maybe so. 
And if correction needs to happen, then correction needs to happen. But my prayer is that you would be able to look past that and see the Son of God saying, come on, come on in. I I, I want you to feel that this morning. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could walk with God. Don't let anyone keep you from that experience. And don't let people change your character. That's the second way to apply this today. Don't let people change your character. You know, there have been seasons of my life where uh, somebody's had their feelings hurt in the church. And up to that point, they had just been hungry for God. Every time the door was open, they were here. They were singing, putting their hands up, studying the Bible, personal devotions, connect groups, Bible studies, love to serve, doing all of this stuff, right? Just the stuff that if you're really thriving in the Lord, you'd say, that's the type of stuff a person who's thriving in the Lord would do. But then somebody offended them. And their whole, their whole thing changed. Like their whole personhood like just changed. And here's what I want to say. If you're here or if you go to another church or if you came from another church because you were hurt, here's, here's what I want to say to you. I want you to look at Hannah and I want you to realize that the same Hannah that we get before her interaction is the same Hannah that we get during and after. And I'm not saying that this is not substantial. I'm not saying that maybe whatever you go through is is not substantial. It is. But don't allow the behaviors or the treatment of other people to change who you are. And that's important for us to understand. There's several scriptures that talk about that. Uh, and, And if you need that list of scripture, I'd be happy to share them with you. But the idea is don't let people keep you from running to God. And if people mistreat you, it needs to be corrected. It needs to be addressed. But don't let the offense change who you are or how you relate to God and his people. The last one is this. If you're making notes this morning, be careful in your correction. Now, I don't want for us to leave today misunderstanding what 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 1 through 20 is about. Because we would be tempted to leave and somebody says, oh, well, what did you learn about a church today? I say, well, we learned that the Bible teaches we shouldn't pass judgment. That is not at all and even close to what the scripture is teaching. You and I, quite frankly, we cannot practice the Christian faith without making some type of judgments in life. In fact, Jesus said, hey, you will know a tree by its fruit. If you look at a tree and you see apples, you are going to make a judgment, aren't you? You're going to pass judgment. It may be a wise, discerning piece of judgment. But we have in our culture have like embraced this idea that we can never make any judgment at all or else we're sinful. It's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible says, be careful when you make a judgment. And if you feel like there's correction that's needed, you need to be careful when you go to do that. Because you can be right and do it wrong and damage people. Or you can think that you understand and you have no idea what's really going on. And you can step into that moment and create more hurt than before. So be careful. I want to leave you with this scripture about being careful. There's two. One is Colossians 4, 6. If you're making notes, it says, Let your speech be always gracious. Even in confrontation, let your speech be gracious. Seasoned with salt so that you'll know how to answer each person. The second scripture will close with this. is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only use words that build up so that you can give grace to everyone who hears. I'm going to give you a quick Greek study before we go on that word corrupt. It means overripe to the point of rotting. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Uh, 
I would be willing to bet there's been a time in your life where you're walking by the refrigerator and you say, I'm a little hungry. I think I'm going to grab a snack. And you open your refrigerator and you look to the back. And there's in the back what used to be a piece of fruit. But it's turned a different color. And the consistency is like squishy. Isn't that great to think about before you go eat lunch? (laughs) Can you imagine reaching in there that squishy little thing that used to be a fruit and just taking a big bite. Isn't that awful? That is, that is the idea of don't let any corrupting thing come out of your mouth. Words that come out rotten. And Eli did that that day. And he paid the price for it. And Hannah paid the price for it. So as we continue and we think about not only putting ourselves in Hannah's shoes, but being cautious that we're not in Eli's shoes, I just want for us to, to understand that in a family, we have to really pay attention to these types of things. I want to ask you to stand as we close. I know our time is out. Thank you so much for hearing me today. Thank you for beginning this journey. We have two more weeks in it. I want to close just with a brief prayer before we offer our blessing and are dismissed. Lord, I want to pray for my friends this morning, all of them that are in this room and all of them that are online, brothers and sisters and friends, that as they reflect on their personal experiences and the emotional connection that they have to a person like Hannah in a situation like We've read about today we're being misjudged. It's such a painful thing. I pray that you would give us grace for the journey and that through this week and the next two weeks, our church would be stronger and healthier because we've acknowledged that painful moments exist in the body of Christ and we've looked to you and to your word for how to navigate those. Bless us, Lord, as we travel this path, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, Again, thanks for being here today. It has been so good to be back. I missed you last week. I appreciate Chris a whole bunch for being willing to lead us through teaching the word of God. And uh, next week, I invite you to come. We're gonna continue talking about church hurt. If you have somebody in your friendship circle Uh, that has experienced that, I encourage you to invite them. Uh, We will be very delicate and tender uh, through this series. But as we go today, I wonder if you would place your hands out to receive this blessing as we conclude. Hear, O church of God, this blessing. Receive it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, we will go with peace because you have given us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. You are loved. God bless you. Have a great week.